So, uh, let's talk today about conservation. No, and this isn't conservation of the environment or conservation of historical artifacts. We're going to talk about conservation of physical quantities, conservation of stuff, physical quantities. And when I, uh, when we talk about conservation of stuff, we could mean conservation of a handful of things that are actually going to be useful in the context of um, fluid mechanics, heat transfer, transport, you know, physics in general, engineering in general. We'll talk about conservation of stuff, what types of things we might uh, conserve in general. And when we formulate these laws, these conservation laws in the context of engineering, um, I'll, I'll just sort of briefly kind of give a qualitative version of what the most useful conservation law equations that we're going to use, right? So I'm going to give a qualitative I'm going to give a qualitative version of the equation and uh, generally, you know, uh, a general uh, for qualitative version for conservation of generally any sort of stuff um, and then also a qualitative version of Quant of uh, conservation of mass. And it turns out that these conservation laws, conservation of stuff, the qualitative versions of these conservation equations, and the conservation of mass that we're going to talk about more specifically today um, are do so. Uh, the qualitative versions of the, as these equations are basically a way for us to keep our bookkeeping straight. You know, a lot of times in fluid mechanics, it's not necessarily the physical concepts that are challenging to most students, but it's the bookkeeping to make sure that you have accounted for all your ins and outs and you have, a, you know, got all the signs right and not put in something twice or missed something entirely. So really, the, the, the trickiness in fluid mechanics um, is oftentimes not necessarily with physical intuitions about phenomena, but rather with the bookkeeping. So we're going to talk about the bookkeeping involved in qualitative versions uh, uh, of these equations. And in particular, we're going to talk about the bookkeeping needed to do conservation of mass. So let's talk about conservation of stuff first. And when I talk about stuff, um, there could be many things that we could conserve, uh, you know, many things that are conserved in our universe. So take a moment now, pause and ponder what things are conserved in, in our world. So pause, ponder, think back to previous classes that you've taken and work it out. So, examples of things that are conserved that uh, that I have come up with, well, mass. Mass is conserved. And of course, mass would have units of kilograms. Um, we can also think about conservation of mass maybe in terms of chemical engineering, right? So I can think about conservation of mass, not just mass entirely, but conservation of specific things. You know, unless you, you're talking about radioactive decay, even through chemical reactions, you have the same number of carbon atoms that you started with as with you ended with, right? So we can think about conservation also in terms of moles of stuff, right? So mass could be in terms of kilograms or moles of stuff. Um, conservation the, you know, other things that are cons uh, conserved in our universe include energy. Energy is conserved. Okay. Um, you know, unless you're sort of dealing with like relativity where energy can be converted back and forth between mass. But again, in the context of most engineering applications, we're not really dealing with that. Unless you're, you know, making black holes for some bioengineering application. Um, and then the uh, additional things that um, are conserved is momentum. And actually, there are two types of momenta that are conserved. There's linear momentum 
and angular momentum. And actually, linear momentum and angular momentum are secretly three in one. You can uh, conserve x momentum, y momentum, and z mo linear momentum. And you can convert angular momentum about three axes as well. So, you know, in general, you know, we have conservation of a lot of stuff. And it's not always obvious which conservation laws we should always be applying. But in the context of fluid mechanics, the ones that are going to come up the most often are probably conservation of mass and also some of our conservation of linear momentum. Mass basically says, hey, we're not creating or destroying fluids in most cases. And momentum basically gives us relationships between how fluids might change velocities and the forces required or the stresses or pressures required to change the directions or speeds of fluids. So we'll do this. Um, and we'll also sometimes talk about energy um, in fluids and in heat transfer. So if we're talking about you know heat flowing from one thing to another, we might talk about conservation of energy. We also might talk about kinetic energies of fluids. So we're basically going to be conserving these things um, in our class. Uh, but more specifically today, we're going to focus on conservation of mass. So let's move on now to talk about a qualitative version of conservation of mass. So the tricky, the tricky thing with bookkeeping of bookkeeping for conservation laws is you have two rules that you have to follow. Count everything. And don't double count. So, um, but that's way easier said than done, right? Like these problems are hard, hard problems, and it's not always, it's not always obvious that you've got everything and that you haven't double counted something. You know, sometimes something can slip in there. That, that you know didn't didn't appear to be there right so bookkeeping for these conservation laws is really hard and the uh, I'm going to you know throughout this course we're going to be practicing and practicing and practicing problem solving strategies to make sure that um, we we do this bookkeeping process in a way that's rigorous so with that when we're solving these types of problems, I like to have a structure that I follow, you know, a general structure. And then I can, you know, start with that general structure, cross off the parts that don't matter, and then proceed from there. So the general structure for conservation laws, the general structure is something like this. First, we need to define our system. with a control volume. And what might a control volume look like? It's basically, I might, I might draw a dotted line that defines some kind of boundary. Things can cross into or out of this boundary. And basically I say, hey, everything within this boundary um, must, be co must be conserved. Stuff can enter, stuff can exit you know, stuff can accumulate within the boundary. And, you know, under some context, things might be created or not, uh, or destroyed. But within this system, we need to sort of, uh, we need to def clearly define this system, and then sort of keep tabs on what enters and exits and, uh, and within that, right? So we define our control system. So step zero is essentially define the control system. And then we can use an equation that applies to this uh, control system. So then apply and then we need to apply this balance of rates. So what do I mean by rates? Well there are four terms in this uh, in this equation. So the first term is the rate of accumulation 
of stuff within our control volume. The rate of accumulation of stuff within the control volume, for example, the, the rate of change of mass of everything within our, within our system must be balanced by three other things. So the rate of stuff entering minus the rate of stuff leaving plus the rate of stuff being generated within within our control volume. So rate of stuff entering the control volume, rate of stuff leaving the control volume, and rate of stuff being generated in the control volume. So the, the time rate of change of stuff in this blob is accounted for by the rate of stuff entering, the rate of stuff exiting, and the rate of stuff being generated in some sense. Uh, and this idea of this balance of rates, what I've outlined here as stuff, this what I've outlined here as stuff, we can apply this general principle for any of the quantities that I've uh, talked about here. It can apply to linear momentum. Linear momentum is conserved. You can have momentum entering and exiting control volumes. You can have mass entering or exiting control volumes. You could have energy entering and exiting. You could have moles of particular chemicals entering and exiting. And some for some of these quantities, we could have non-zero generation or destruction as well. You know, for example, if we talk about moles of specific chemicals, you know, moles of methane, methane could be consumed or generated in chemical reactions. Whereas, you know, mass, general mass obviously isn't going to be created or destroyed. So this idea, this, this general balance of rates, accumulation is equal to the rate of accumulation with, of stuff in the control volume is balanced by stuff entering, stuff exiting, and stuff being generated within it. So the key thing here is that this is a time rate of change, right? If we talk about rates, you know, this is all of these things are going to have units of stuff per second, right? These rates, all of these rates are going to have units of stuff per second, right? So if we're talking about conservation of mass, all of the terms in this general equation are going to have units of kilograms per second. If we talk about energy, all of the terms in these in these equations are going to have units of joules per second, um, or watts, which is equivalent to a joule per second, right? So, um, and you know, in just a couple lectures, we'll talk about exactly what we mean by linear, uh, you know, linear momentum. What is a unit of linear momentum and all that stuff, right? So we anticipate this is this is not a in an absolute measure of stuff, but a balance of rates of stuff, and the balance of rates of stuff should basically just perfectly cancel out as described by this equation. So we're balancing rates. We're balancing stuff per seconds. So now let's talk. Uh, so we talked about this qualitative version of the equation in the bookkeeping. That's this here. This is what I mean by a qualitative version of this. So now let's apply this qualitative version to conservation of mass and introduce the quantitative, the calculus-y, algebra -y version of this equation that we're going to end up uh, being useful in class. And in previous versions of this class, I kind of started with a ground-up approach to building this equation of conservation of mass. Um, and, that's, and that's what I have in the notes um, online. But again, I, I think that's a little tedious. I'm just going to give you the equation and then walk through um, all, like what all of the terms mean, what groupings of the terms mean, and you know how you, how you should interpret this, right? So so let's now work out conservation of mass. This conservation law applied in a very calculus sort of way. So let's bring it up here. Great. So the left hand side of the equation is 
d dt of a quantity, an integral of rho dv. And so this is the left-hand side of conservation of mass. And then the right-hand side of conservation of mass is minus an integral of rho times the quantity v dot n dA. And this, is an, this left hand side is an integral over the volume of our CV. And this right is an integral over the surface of our control volume. Oof, yikes, this is looking pretty rough, right? This is looking pretty calculus-y. Don't panic. We're going to walk through this together. So in order to work some of the stuff out, again, I'll talk about you know what, what all these, they're derivatives of integrals, oh, dot products, vectors. Ah, this is, you know, this can be overwhelming. Um, but we'll, we'll work all this together. And eventually, all of this stuff, all this stuff is going to make sense. This stuff is going to make sense pretty soon. Stay tuned. So, um, but first, let's talk about what each of these terms mean. And then we'll sort of tease out what the meanings of each of the stuff within these terms is. So I'm going to put my conservation law right here. So this is the rate of mass accumulation in our control volume is this left-hand side. And then we had rate entering, rate of mass entering, minus rate of mass leaving, plus rate of mass being generated. So if we think about how, you know, how do terms in this qualitative version of the equation match up to what we have here? Well, this part that we have here, the rate of change of mass accumulation in the, con uh, in the control volume, here, this ddt, that's going to kind of account for the, race, the rate. And this integral is basically going to describe the amount of mass in our control volume. So what I've circled in green in the qualitative version of the equation down here is what I've circled in green in this part up here. Then, um, if I think about the rate of mass entering and the rate of mass leaving, these two terms together are accounted for this term here. And if I think about integrating, if, I, if I'm integrating over a surface, things to do with velocities, well, it's velocity of fluid that's basically carrying mass in or carrying it out. And basically, this integral over the whole surface is going to account for both of our ins and our outs in terms of mass entering and exiting. So uh, these two terms are basically accounted for by this term here. And then you might be being like, hey, Professor Lannan, You've forgotten a term down here, but if I think about conservation of mass, can there be a rate of mass being generated? Well, unless I'm dealing with like relativistic physics or radioactive decay or something like that, we, there's no such thing as generation of mass. You can't just pull mass out of nowhere, out of the ether. That, that can't happen, right? So there's no generation or you know, depletion term in this uh, in this conservation of mass. So conservation of mass is basically ins and outs balancing with a rate of accumulation. So in case ac accumulation is kind of a little bit of a vague rate, uh, a, a, a vague term here, let's kind of describe this in other words. This is the time rate of change of how much mass is 
in our control volume. All right, so in a sense, if, if I had some control volume, let's say it looked like this potato right here, and this there were some there was some amount of mass in this control volume right here. Um, let's say uh, you know let's say I had you know m amount of mass. You know let's say this this control volume everything in the control volume had mass m. Then this then the time the time rate of change of m would be the left hand side of this equation. And if I think about the time rate of change of m, that means this. This term right here is essentially the mass of everything in our control volume. Right, so if, if this is the mass of everything in our control volume, then the time rate of change of mass must be accounted for by the rate of stuff entering and the rate of stuff leaving. So what I've highlighted in orange is the mass of everything in here, m. And its time derivative is accounted for by the net rate in and out. So, but you know, what, what does this calculus mean, right? So that's what the DDT means. What does the calculus mean in here? Well, there are a couple terms that I sort of need that we need to define, right? So, first, um, if I have some control volume, there's nothing to say that this control volume all needs to be made of the same material, right? I could have you know, some air, I could have some air over here, and I could have some water over here, I could have some lead or some mercury over here, right? Um, I could even have solids, I could have, you know, whatever, I could have any phase of matter, right? This, this control volume could contain a bunch of different stuff in it all throughout. So what do I mean? Um, so how do I account for this overall mass? Of this well anytime you have a, a potentially varying or non-uniform distribution inside something you basically go with the approach of carving it up into a whole bunch of little chunks and we'll say each chunk has volume dv and in the context of this course v my v's that are related to volume my volume v's I'm going to cross like this just to differentiate from my velocity v's which I'm going to sort of do as this lowercase cursive v. So just to clarify this is a velocity. A velocity v is going to look like this lowercase cursive v. A volume v is going to be sort of this capital V with a cross through it. Um, and that's because you know we'll have problems where we have both velocity and volume, and a, there's we can't just have a single v. That, bookkeeping, right? We got to keep things straight. So, volume-related v's are going to be these ones with a cross. Velocity-related v's are going to be these lowercase cursive v's. So anyway, um, I take up my control volume. I break it up into a whole bunch of chunks. Each little chunk has a dv. So that base. So um, so that's that. The mass of this chunk, the mass of a single chunk, the mass of a chunk, ooh, can't really read that, the mass of a chunk is the density of that chunk times dv, right? So if dv has units of uh, volume, i.e. meters cubed, right? dv, you know, volume has units of meters cubed, so a little chunk of volume also has units of meter cubed, and mass density is kilograms per meter cubed, then this quantity together, this rho times dv, is essentially one little chunk of mass from one little part of our control volume. And then if I add up all those little chunks, that's going to give me the overall mass, which is this quantity that I've highlighted in here. So if I add up all of the masses of all the little chunks, that's this integral of rho dv. That, that's this highlighted in orange here. That's the mass of everything in our control volume. And its time rate of change, I put a derivative out front. Whew. So 
uh, a little bit messy, but if we kind of break down each of these terms, each of it makes sense, right? I'm taking my control volume, I'm dividing it up into a bunch of little dVs. Each little dV has a mass of rho times dV, and then if I add up all the masses of all those little chunks, that's the total mass in my control volume, and its time derivative is the time rate of change of mass of everything in the control volume. That time rate of change of mass has to be accounted for by the rate of mass entering and the rate of mass leaving. All right, now let's deal with the right-hand side. So I'm just going to rewrite it. So. So the, the rho times dv, integrate all that over the volume of the cv, time derivative, that's our left-hand side, is equal to minus the integral over the surface of our control volume of rho times v dot n, and I'll define what, these, what all these terms mean in just a sec, dA. So let's deal with the, the, the second term. So imagine I have the same control volume. Let's think about how mass gets into or out of this control volume. So uh, mass gets into or out of this control volume when it's carried by moving fluid. So mass enters or exits with moving moving fluid and in particular fluid that's moving to cross the surface so what does this mean well fluid needs to be moving in order for mass to enter or exit the control volume, right? If the fluid's just chilling right at the surface, then nothing's entering or exiting through a place where the velocity is zero at the surface, right? So we need, we need velocity to be non-zero at the surface in order for fluid to be entering or exiting, right? So velocities, velocities of our fluids need to be non-zero at the surface in order for fluid to uh, to enter or exit in order for mass to enter or exit now not not only does that fluid need to be moving but it needs to be moving in such a way that crosses the surface so let's imagine a couple scenarios here right so if I had some fluid moving yeah, this fluid's gonna be crossing the surface, right? Fluid is gonna be exiting here. You know, if I have some fluid moving like this, fluid's gonna be entering, right? No doubt about it. If I have some velocity here and some velocity there, these velocities are going to carry mass into and out of the control volume, respectively. But I could have a case where I have a non-zero velocity Right? I could have some non-zero velocity right here, but this velocity is not really contributing to, this velocity right here is not contributing to mass entering or exiting. Right, So I have some velocity here, it's not contributing to mass entering or exiting, and if this velocity is not contributing to mass entering or exiting, then I don't want to count it in my conservation of mass, right? This should have no contribution to mass entering or exiting. So how do we account for sometimes vo velocity and, you know, velocity resulting in mass entering or exiting and some uh, not? That's where this n comes in. So that's where this n comes in. So n is defined to be a unit vector is a unit vector that's normal to the surface and always pointing outwards. So in this case, n, n is a vector that's always pointing outwards.
So, how does N help us out with this bookkeeping? Well, what is the dot product? Pause and ponder. What is the dot product of V and N in this, uh, for, for this one that I've highlighted here? So, pause and ponder. What's the dot product of these two vectors? Well, the dot product of these two vectors, the dot product of any two vectors that are perpendicular, the dot product is zero. The dot product of perpendicular vectors is zero. So this dot product of V and N does the bookkeeping for us for saying, hey, yeah, I know you're gonna have, you're sometimes gonna have velocity that, sh that doesn't contribute to mass entering or exiting. In this way, only the components of velocity that cause mass to cross the surface will be, will be count accounted for in this conservation of mass. So if I have some velocity that's, let's say, directly exiting the surface, then all of this velocity is going to result in um, then all of this velocity is going to result in mass exiting. Right? So in this case, all of V goes to mass goes to mass exiting. Right? And in this case, all of V goes to mass entering. So in this case, you know, we have all of V going to mass entering, all of it going to exiting. You know, let's say in this case, V doesn't contribute at all to mass entering or exiting. And in the case where let's say I had some V that's oblique, it's only the component that is normal to the surface that that causes any to be entering or exiting. And that's that's accounted for in this dot product. So let's go a step further and deal with this entering or exiting phenomenon. And here, if I have a v dot n, if I take some vector and dot it with a normal vector that is in precisely in the same direction, this dot product, this dot product, the dot product here is simply uh, v's magnitude. So in this case, it's V's, it's V's magnitude, and it's positive because they're both pointing in the same direction. In this case, if I wanted to compute this dot product, this dot product would be minus V's, would be minus V's magnitude, right? If you have, if you have two vectors, and you dot them, uh, or if you have a unit vector and a vector, and you take the dot product and they're pointing in opposite directions, then you take the product of their magnitudes. The unit vector has a magnitude of one, the, the velocity vector has whatever its magnitude is, and in this case you get minus because they're pointing in opposite directions. And if you ever had some oblique thing, then you know it would need to be the cosine of whatever theta is between them. But hopefully, you know, hopefully in the context of this course we'll be able to construct most of our control volumes in such a way that we won't need to take too many things. We're either going to get minus, positive, or zero if we construct sensible control volumes. All right. So, so there we have it. Um, so that's the that's the deal with this v dot n. All right, let's talk a little bit more about some of the other terms in this cohesion, but I'm going to go to a new sheet of paper because this is getting a little bit cluttered. We talked very thoroughly about v dot n and how it's useful for mass crossing the surface, but we haven't talked about some of the other stuff in this. So, so. This v dot n is basically 
positive, this v dot n is positive when is positive when stuff exits, right? If v dot n is positive, then stuff is exiting. So in this case, um, this this integral right here is essentially everything that's leaving. But something that's entering could sort of be considered, in a sense, negatively leaving. So this integral essentially accounts, you know, saying, hey, any stuff that's entering, we're just going to put it in as negative leaving with this dot product here. And that's why we have this minus out here. This minus right here is essentially this minus right here. This integral is essentially saying everything that's leaving um, and things that entering will just sort of be negative within this dot product right here. So it'll come out as equivalent to positive. So that's, uh, that's, that's the bookkeeping right here. But we haven't talked about some of the other parts of this equation. You know, what's density doing here? What's dA doing here? Um, and how does it all balance with everything that should be on the left-hand side of this equation right here? So how does it balance with ddt of the integral of rho dv? All right, so let's square let's square this away. So I'm going to draw my control volume here, and what uh, what this dA does is essentially saying, hey, let's carve up the surface into a bunch of little patches. So we'll carve up. little patches and each little patch is going to have an area dA. Now remember in some of our previous problem solving strategies we said hey if there's something that could be varying right if we have some variable like let's say pressure or shear stress or in this case velocity if velocity can vary over these whole surfaces then we're going to need to carve up that surface into a bunch of little chunks apply you know, apply some analysis to each little chunk and then add them all up in total. So that's what's that's what we're going to do here. We've divided up our surface into a bunch of little chunks. Each little chunk has dA, and then we're going to integrate all of the mass flow rates uh, into slash out of each of these little pieces. And by adding up all of the mass flow rates into or out of all of these little pieces, we'll get the overall mass flow rate that should balance the accumulation of mass inside the control volume. So we, break, we take up our surface, we break it up into a bunch of little dA's, and there we have it. So, um, so there we have it. Now, each little dA is going to have some mass flow. Each little dA is going to have its own little mass flow rate into or out of it. Um, in order to, in order to, uh, such that when we add them all up, we'll balance the, the net mass flow rate will balance the accumulation. So, how do we get to mass flow rates from this quantity right here? Well, I like to think about units. So, and of course, baby, you know who likes to think about units as well. So, if I think about dA, dA is going to have units of meters squared. v dot n, well, n is a unit vector, so it's, it's, it's just unitless, right? It has just magnitude 1, but v has units of meters per second. And rho, again, rem again remember, rho is mass density, and that's going to have units of kilograms per meter cubed. So if I take kilograms per meter cubed and multiply it by meters per second times meters squared, um, I'm going to get something that makes sense, right? So let's first just look at this part of it. So if I take meters per second and multiply it by meters squared, then I get meters cubed per second. And that's essentially a volumetric flow rate. So this meters cubed per second is essentially how, what is the volume flow rate out of one little thing? And if I take a volume flow rate and multiply it by a density, 
Then, all together, I'm going to have kilograms per meter cubed times meters cubed per second. That's going to have kilograms per second, right? So the term, the units of all of this stuff is basically kilograms per second. And that's what we anticipated in balancing rates, balancing rates of mass entering and exiting and a rate of mass accumulation in here, right? So we, we looked at this term on the left, right? dv as units of meters cubed, rho is kilograms per meters cubed, and if I take its derivative, d dt of this is going to have units of 1 over seconds out front. So kilograms per second on the left hand side, kilograms per second on the right hand side. This is the time rate of change of mass in the control volume, and this is all of the mass flow rates into or out of the surface that defines the boundary of this control volume. So there we have it. This is a walkthrough of all of the terms here. But again, you know, don't panic if all of this um, you know, will take some time to digest. We'll do uh, a handful of example problems in an upcoming lecture. So here's a walkthrough of conservation of mass for fluid mechanics. Thanks, and good luck with your fluid studies.